Hello, my name is Madison Thomas, and today we are going to talk about the Western Interior Seaway, what it was, how it came to be, the creatures that inhabited it, and how us humans have come to know about it, even though it hasn't been around for about 95 million years. The Western Interior Seaway has many names, the Cretaceous Seaway, the Neobrarian Seaway, the North American Inland Sea, and various others. It was a huge body of water that went straight through the continent of North America, splitting it in half. The western half became known as Laramidia, and the east was coined Appalachia. As I mentioned moments ago, it came around about 95 million years ago, during the mid-Cretaceous period, and began to slowly disappear very shortly after the end of the Cretaceous. So, how did this massive body of water just randomly come about? Well, various events led up to its beginning, and it certainly didn't happen overnight. The Western Interior Seaway was started because two tectonic plates, the Farallon and the North American, collided. Upon this collision, the Farallon, excuse me if I'm mispronouncing that, plate began to slide beneath the North American plate. To give you an idea of how long this would have taken, science has shown that over the course of just one year, tectonic plates would only move about two to three centimeters. Not inches, not miles, but centimeters. This remarkably slow impact caused the Rocky Mountains in the west and the Appalachians in the east to gradually form, and along the end of those formations, a large basin began to develop throughout the center of the continent as the Farallon continued to slide beneath the North American creating somewhat of a cavity in the earth. It was essentially a giant bowl that extended over miles and miles of land. Since the earth's overall sea level was so much higher during the Cretaceous period, this low basin made it possible for the waters from the Arctic Ocean in the north and the Gulf of Mexico in the south to slowly trickle in through the center of the North American continent. And this was just the beginning. Over hundreds and thousands of years, as sea levels and the environment kept up their continuous changes, the western interior seaway would grow and retract and even change shape many times. At its peak, this inland sea stretched just over 620 miles in width, and it was nearly 3,000 feet deep at some points, which is relatively shallow in terms of such lar large bodies of water today. As the water levels began to fall, deltas, which are narrow and river-like spillways, began to form at the most shallow points. Though it took no time to explain these things, as I said before, all of these events happened ever so gradually over the course of hundreds and thousands of years, far more than any person would be able to see in their lifetime, if humans were to exist during that period, which they did not. <laughs> Since we now know how the Western Interior Seaway came about, now it is time to discuss the quite literally awe-striking marine life that filled its waters during its time of existence. Since time is limited, I will stick to just a few of the largest and most interesting species of aquatic animals that ruled the seas over all of those years. <laughs> I will begin by talking about the Mosasaur, a huge, four-finned, 50-plus foot fish that evolved from early types of large lizard-like land creatures. The Mosasaur preferred more shallow, warmer waters of the seaway and was considered a mostly predatory species. The next is the Ichthyosaur, Another large predator that has the capability to grow as long as 52 feet and closely resemble today's dolphins. Their sharply pointed snouts made it, made it possible to stun and pierce through their prey, which made for very easy and efficient hunting. Another scary sea dweller was the Echidus. The Inchidus, there's an N in there. <laughs> a mid-sized fish which averaged at about five feet in length. They are most famous for their large fangs, 
which grew in the front of their teeth, which became a very useful hunting asset. These fangs could grow as long as three inches, and these weren't big fish. Another predatory... I'm sorry, this is probably why this species earned the nickname the saber-toothed herring, because they were relatively average in size compared to all these other creatures, and they just had these giant teeth in the front. Another predatory fish that didn't look quite as scary as some of its counterparts was the Xyphactinus. The Xyphactinus was an elongated, hardy, meaty fish that grew up to 20 feet in length. And the first fossil traces of this animal, in fact, were found right here in Kansas. This is special because well-preserved fossils of this species are hard to come by because every time that one would die, most commonly a shark would come and scavenge on its body. But the scariest, largest, and probably most famous beast of the western interior seaway is the Megalodon shark. This gigantic creature could grow up to 98 feet in length and truly ruled the waters as the biggest predator. The teeth of the Megalodon have been estimated to be as long as 8 inches in length and it had the jaw power to bite through a whale-sized animal in half. These are just a few of the countless reasons why this may be the most well-known marine animal of the time. Now, we have learned quite a bit about the Western Interior Seaway. We've talked about what it is, how it came to be. We've also briefly discussed the vastly diverse marine life that inhabited it. But the ultimate question is, how do we know all of this? What evidence is left over from an environment that hasn't been around for 90 million plus years? And how can we find that out? How do modern day scientists go about figuring out what it all means? Well, I will begin by telling you about some of the physical evidence that is still intact today and then continue on to talking about the methods used to discover even more about what was going on at the time. Near Jordan, Montana, there is a rock formation called Hell Creek. Similar forms can be found in North Dakota, South Dakota, and Wyoming. But it is a compiled mixture of hardened, fresh, and brackish water clays, mudstones, and sandstones deposited during the later years of the seaway built up due to erosion caused by the smaller river-like deltas mentioned earlier in my speech. These freestanding monuments are often commercially excavated and through the process a wide variety of fossils, mostly of the ancient fish that lived in these ancient waters, are brought to the surface. Another overwhelming display of evidence from the Western Interior Seaway is that it has withstood the test of time is the Neobara Formation, located in Knox County, Nebraska. Also known as the Neobara Chalk, it is a collection of huge rock-like formations that are made up of layers upon layers of chalk-like substance and limestone. Both of these materials came about due to hundreds and thousands of years worth of dead marine animals and other organic matter through the seas, settling to the bottom of what once was the seafloor of the Western Interior Seaway and hardening and fossilizing over time. <coughs> Excuse me. Trace fossils, spon of, trace fossils of sponges, sea worms, and smaller crustaceans have been f discovered in these formations, as well as various species of fish, including sharks, and the fish and sharks are a lot more common to find than the trace fossils of the smaller animals. It is incredible to think that a vast sea largely covered what we now know as North America today. What's even more incredible is the size and frighteningly powerful marine animals that used to fill it with life. It truly goes to show that the earth is constantly changing, and with geology, we are able to research and discover what went on all those millions of years ago through excavations and studies of sites such as the Hell Creek and Neobara Chalk sites, upon countless others, I'm sure. Well, thank you for watching. This has been a brief discussion over the Western Interior Seaway, and thank you for your time.